bread. I'm hungry. Let us pray again. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be open to where you desire to lead us. O oh Lord our God, living bread among us. Amen. Last Sunday we talked about bread and we got mighty hungry. So hungry that one of you went home and baked bread that very afternoon. So hungry that our youth minister, Gary McCullough, went out and bought the staff a box of Twinkies. We'd had a debate at the staff table about whether or not Twinkies still exist because Hostess went out of business about four years ago, but they're back. No worry, Twinkies exist. My children had never had them, and it, it tells you a lot when your six-year-old takes one bite and puts it down and walks away. It left us hungry. It left us unsatisfied. Jesus repeats the words from last week, right? I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be what? Hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But he's not repeating himself this week exactly, nor is John writing in circles. Last Sunday, the attention was upon Jesus as the gift, free gift from God. And this Sunday, the focus is on Jesus at the center of faith to which God draws us, his people, into. And in truth, the conversation is actually getting more and more difficult. The crowds have gone across the Sea of Galilee again to chase Jesus down, and when they get there, they start complaining. And do you know why? Because suddenly they realize that he looks familiar to them. Hey, wait a minute. Is this the Jesus that grew up next door? Oh, you know what? I think he grew up in Trinity Park. His dad is Joseph. He's the one that owns the woodworking shop on the corner of Duke and Main, right? Yeah, this is, this is the, bo this is the boy next door? <laughs> Come on, God, really? Are we to expect that the boy next door, the, the, the ordinary common human that messes up just like us, is also God? Can one that's just like us save us? That doesn't work. You know, I once again find the crowds speaking for me. Because when I'm distressed, I need a God of strength. And when I'm fear-filled, I need a God that shows up quickly. And when I'm falling into pieces, I need a God that is consistent and all-powerful. And this idea of God coming as human, I'm right there complaining as well. Can one that looks like me save me? How many of you, I'm going to imagine that almost all of us can remember at least one girl next door or boy next door from our childhood. Give me some names. Who were they? Remember them. I was the girl next door to a girl named Mary Ann Young. And here we are. Okay, yes. I'm the one in the glasses. Oh, I so do not miss those glasses. And so to Marianne, I was the girl next door. I had not seen Marianne in over 13 years until she walked into the sanctuary a month ago when I officiated the wedding of her brother-in-law from Chapel Hill. And when Marianne walked through this door, I laughed and I said, isn't it weird to see me in a robe? This must be so strange to see me in a pulpit. Isn't it odd that Heather Showalter from 4210 Oak Ridge Road, Mount Crawford, Virginia, can be used by God in this way? When you know me, Marianne, you know how competitive I am and that I stomped all over you to win the race. You know that sometimes I showed up to your house not out of friendship because out of a desire to be close to your cute twin brother, Micah. And we messed up together, didn't we? It was you and I going too fast on the mini bike. We slammed right into that cow. Oh, I'm not even joking. 
And I have the scar on my right knee to prove it. You know, I always worry, or maybe I assume, that people who know me as the girl next door, who know me as human and flawed, can't possibly believe that I can get in this pulpit and be used by God. And I've recognized something, that really the problem is my own. That I'm the one that gets in this pulpit and thinks, really, Lord? Can these words be more than just a speech? Can your words, offered in love and prayer, be more than human? God, how can the ordinary and the common be made extraordinary? How does that work? And the crowd, they grumble. This is the ordinary boy next door. Maybe they're angry. Maybe they're confused. Maybe they're afraid. That in the end, they'll be too full of doubt to believe. Or that in the end, they'll be too flawed to be saved. And Jesus says in verse 43, do not complain among yourselves. So basically Jesus says, okay, I want you to shut your mouths and I want you to listen so that we will understand that the Jews don't understand. Do we understand? And then Jesus says, no one can come to me unless drawn by God who sent me, by the Father who sent me. And this word up there, drawn, can also be translated as the more intensive dragged. And dragged is used elsewhere in John to describe what fishermen and women do when they drag in the nets, right? And so there's this incredible visual of God as Fisher God, casting God's net of, of grace and love over all of you here this morning and dragging you closer to God. And as beautiful as that is, it is also, honestly, it's confusing, isn't it? I mean, I was raised to believe that I have a decision to make. I have to choose yes or no to Jesus Christ in my life. And yet now I'm being told this morning that the initiative belongs to God and God alone. Well, which is it? Is it my decision or is it God's? And there's no easy answers. Should there be? I'm always tempted to stand up here and try to give answers. One of our church members and colleagues, Will Williman, he gives a stab at it. Listen to his words. Whatever we need to comprehend Jesus, to come to Jesus, to see who he is and what he means, must come to us as a divine gift. Say gift. Through revelation, not through our earnest efforts, not by our own work. And you know what? I think about that every time I preach because I get up here with a plan and I want to make a point, a specific point to you. And every single time one of you comes up to me and you tell me what you heard God say through me and it is, has nothing to do with anything on this paper. Right? A divine gift given despite who we are. Whatever we need in order to comprehend Jesus must come as a gift, not something of our own devising. It must come down from heaven. Say, come down from heaven. And maybe we find this a little threatening to our faith, this idea of being drawn to Jesus, that it's ultimately up to God, but maybe also comforting. The bread of life comes down from heaven. And oftentimes we try to twinkinize it. Yes, I made that word up. Twinkinize it, right? We try to take what God gives as a gift and rationalize it into ordinary, ordinary or even less than ordinary. Oh, this is just a man-made, processed event, this thing called worship, stuffed full of fake sentiment. That's what church is. Twinkie. We deny the gift. And the extraordinary at the font is no more than tap water. The beauty at the table is no more than a loaf of bread from Harris Teeter. It's not something of our own devising to comprehend Jesus, but a gift. And Jesus says, 
Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes. One of our interns from this past year, Will McLean, is now an associate pastor at Edenton Street in downtown Raleigh. And a few weeks ago, he preached his first sermon at the 8.30 service, a very traditional, very highly liturgical service. And in his sermon, he began to tell a story about a friend of his who's homeless. And suddenly, a man walked through the door at the front, right in front of the whole congregation, and started talking to Will in the middle of his sermon. And from all appearances, the man was not sober, and the man appeared to be homeless. Well, Will began to talk back. Welcome, join us, sit down, have a seat. And later on in that very same service, they prayed over this new friend who had walked into worship. After the worship service, several people came up to Will and said, how did you do that? He said, do what? How did you plan for a homeless person to walk in while you were telling a story about homelessness? How did you plan that? And we, give the, we take the gift that God gives and we rationalize. And we try to figure it out with our heads. How did you plan that? I sat in a committee meeting this week. And the person that was in charge of the devotion asked us all to share a God moment with one another. And I watched as you all allowed God to show up as a gift through the ordinary, through teaching in a high school, through teaching in Sunday school, how God showed up for you in a sanctuary in Europe, candles and praying, how God showed up for you in a chance meeting in an airport, one church member to the other in the Midwest. How God showed up to you, for you through the love of a mother-in-law where before there had been disdain. Now some of you might say that that's not very ordinary. The love of a mother-in-law, it may be more of a miracle. But the willingness, right, to see these things as God's gift, living bread poured down. Jesus comes and says, very truly I tell you, and the root in Greek of those two words tell us that they're the same thing. So why is Jesus saying, truly, truly, or amen, amen? This is Jesus' way to say that what I'm getting ready to tell you next is the most important part of this lesson for today. Listen up. And here he says five words. Whoever believes has eternal life. Repeat that after me. Whoever believes has eternal life. Whoever believes, and that word believe is actually better translated faith. But faith is, a, is, is not best used as a verb in English, so it would sound weird, wouldn't it, to say um, faithing. But that's a great translation. Whoever is faithing. And when we say faith, we're talking about trust. Trust. And that word eternal, growing up, I always knew that trusting in God would mean that I would have eternal life and that that was something right that came when I died. Many, many, many years away, I pray. It seemed hard to trust now for that gift later, very honestly. And so I love the importance of the word eternal here because it's in the present tense. This is about trusting God today. To receive eternal life, God's reality today and forever. And I would imagine that there's some of you who have come in here today carrying a heavy burden that long for God's reality in your life right now, today. And Jesus says, it is here. Receive. And then he goes back to what he knows, what we know, to invite us into what we don't. Remember how your grandparents were complaining, Steed? Remember how your aunts and uncles were upset with God, Delena? And God did not abandon them? No, God rained down bread, manna from heaven. And so this morning, we're invited to ask the same question of our lives. Lord, it's a mystery, and I begin with what I know. How has God's manna rained down in our lives before this day? So that we might step in to the mystery and the not knowing. Because eventually the manna, the Twinkie, 
It doesn't sustain you forever. You die and we die. And here before you is a bread that lasts forever. Taking a step into this mystery is not easy. It's an invitation to go beyond our head knowledge and to not rationalize everything that happens and to believe that God shows up in the ordinary and in the girl next door, that might be you, and in the boy next door, and that might be you. Last Sunday afternoon and evening, I thought maybe you all would be talking about bread or something from the sermon or one of the hymns. That's not what you were talking about. You were talking about a friend who worships by saying amen, and he said it the whole service from the balcony. And it was a beautiful thing to watch you all together talk about that. That was uncomfortable. That seemed disruptive. Does God show up in that? Maybe God does show up in that. What does that mean for me? What does that mean for him? What was he saying? If I had understood what he was saying, maybe I would have joined in. I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never again be hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be a Twinkie can never do that. 